Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this is our first professional lunch series event for fall of 2020, and this is gonna be for finance. We're so excited to have Thomas Regandi from Moody's Investor Service here with us today. He is a Poly Foundation Board Treasurer as well. So Thomas, can you please just first introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of your career trajectory so far? Sure, of course, happy to Sam, and, and many thanks for the invitation. Uh, you know, certainly to Jamie and uh, also Gia for their excellent work as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as Sam mentioned, my name is Tom Burgandy. Uh, I have uh, three letters after my name, uh, CFA, so also a chartered financial analyst. Um, I work at Moody's Investor Service. I've been there for eight years, uh, where I cover a portfolio of 34 infrastructure companies. So airports, ports, toll roads, power, um, you know, water, wastewater, and uh, I've been everywhere from a, uh, a, um, a, 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 a tunnel under construction in a Midwestern city um, that I was lowered down into uh, by a man cage <laughs> to, um, to uh, basically standing over the water intake valve of the Hoover Dam. <laughs> so, uh, um, you, you know, th I, those are certain benefits to the job that uh, not everyone else gets to see, but I'm responsible for a portfolio of uh, $15 billion of, of infrastructure debt. I've been doing this for eight years. Um, you know, of that eight years, uh, since I graduated from Macaulay in 2012, um, have been a lead analyst for six of those years. So I was, uh, you know, a pretty pr one of the youngest lead analysts in Moody's history. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, very fortunate and, um, you know, sort of my involvement with Macaulay, um, dates back to, um, a former colleague of ours, uh, Ophronima, um, at, the, at Macaulay who had reached out to me, um, I guess it was a few months after I graduated, um, and had mentioned that she was very keen to connect students to, um, you know, alumni who were in the finance world, uh, for mentoring. So then there was just a tremendous amount of demand that we saw from that. And then, um, you know, it was like, it, it was years ago, I mean, I would do um, every, um, every Sunday, we would have um, uh, basically mentoring sessions. So from like 4pm to like 11 o'clock, I was, you know, I, I had like 30 minute sessions with like all these Macaulay students and, and also CUNY students in general, sort of um, to tell them how to network their way in uh, to essentially the, the job of their dreams. And it's for, for Macaulay students, we're a little disadvantaged because we're a young school and we don't have the long-term, long tenured relationships with employers that, um, you know, Harvard does or a Yale or whatever. You know, Gia and Jamie are doing great work, um, you know, to get us to that point, but it's just sort of, um, it's just like a structural thing, given we're, we're just a very young university. And, you know, sometimes we're difficult to, um, to explain. But once our students get in the door, it is, it is so easy for employers to see the value that our students bring because we're so hardworking relative to our peers. I mean, you know, I work with, have with people who went to every Ivy League school, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, Stanford, you, you know, you name it. And, um, you, you know, sort of the, 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 the people who um, I try to, you know, help our, our, our Coley students and CUNY students because, you know, there are often people that have zero sense of entitlement and, um, and also have the desire to work really hard. Whereas sort of your peers are just, there's a sense of entitlement there um, like they don't need to struggle to, to get their foot in the door for an interview or their resume in the pile. So, and our students are so amazing. I mean, you know, they, they, they really take, take the guidance on how to, you know, do this networking. You, you know, it's a little different these days because we're not able to go to events in person. And what I would do was sort of tell all of my mentees to go to all these, uh, these events and uh, different organizations host different events. Um, and to network, and that's how you, uh, that's how you learn, um, you, you know, and, and, and sort of request um, coffee meetings with, with professionals after, the, after those meetings and, and sort of guiding them on how to do it. And then, you know, building that relationship with that uh, prospective uh, employer. 
Um, so that's a very high level of sort of what I do. Um, and then also a few years ago, three years ago, I was elected to the uh, Macaulay uh, Foundation uh, board. Um, and uh, I guess it's three or so. And uh, just uh, six months ago, I was, um, I, I was then, uh, you know, selected to be the treasurer of the board. So the first alumni um, officer of the board. So, um, you know, very thankful to, uh, to folks like uh, Tony Meyer, who is our chairman, uh, who is just an incredible, incredible supporter of the college, just an incredible person. Um, and then also, you know, certainly Mary Pearl, Dean Pearl, and, um, you, you know, Jeff Glick is fantastic. And, you know, and just be, having the opportunity to work with, um, with the Macaulay staff, who are all just amazing people. So, uh, and the other thing is, I'm always here for, for all of you. I mean, you, you know, the, the, the thing that I get worked up about is sort of the lack of opportunities um, for easy placements um, that, that City University of New York and public university students have. So, you know, I, I do everything in my power to help, you know, you, right? Um, you, view me as someone who's like really vested in, 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 in you because I am, you know, I, I really believe that I have a, you know, to, to who those, to, um, there's a, there's a saying, uh, to whom much has been given, much is expected. So um, it's just very important to me to con that to all of you that, uh, you know, I'm here for you, even though you don't know me, but you know, it's like, you know, just that affiliation with Macaulay means that, you know, I'm helping you no matter what. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, certainly pass it back to Sam for further questions. Thank you so much, Top. That was like really great. I'm really glad that you are giving back to the Macaulay community in so many ways. Um, can you please share a little bit about your undergraduate experience at Macaulay, what activities you were involved in, and then what you learned from them? Yeah, sure. So I did a triple major. I don't know if you could still do that these days. I did a triple major in finance, accounting, and economics at the College of Staten Island. Um, it was a lot of coursework. Um, I don't recommend doing that. It was like 140 something credits. Um, but, uh, you know, and then I was also involved in extracurricular activities. I actually did research with a professor in infrastructure finance and in public finance. Um, and that really sparked my interest in it. And I was able to, to get this job at Moody's um, you know, sort of leveraging that, that, that ex research experience I had as an undergraduate. Um, I was also involved, I was the managing editor for the, uh, the newspaper that we had at the College of Staten Island, The Banner. Um, and then also I had another internship with the, uh, with the Comptroller's Office, um, which uh, really gave me a good sense for, um, you know, not only the importance of institutional investors, if you will, uh, but also sort of where finance and public policy come together as one. And that's something that I deal with every day, um, you know, communicating with uh, the CFOs, so, so chief financial officers, treasurers, controllers, you know, CEOs, right, presidents, executive directors, and, and board directors of, of really major uh, institutions. Um, like I had said, uh, you know, I've, <laughs> I've been to a lot of cool places and done a lot of uh, fun things. I, I certainly, um, with that Hoover Dam one, that was amazing because um, I'm the lead analyst for the power that gets generated for the Hoover Dam. So I, I sometimes get to go out and, and view the sites, right? So I'm standing there and I was in, we were in the bowels of the dam at this point. So I, I was getting a tour um, with the senior management of the generation side of the house and then also the manager of the dam from the Bureau of Land Management. So we're standing on this metal grate. And the problem is I had recently watched on the plane flying out to Los Angeles because I first met with some institutional investors there before, um, you know, a colleague and I made the trip to, to Arizona uh, to, to, to do the site visit. And uh, I had watched this movie called San Andreas. I don't know if you've seen it, but, but, but basically in the movie, um, the Hoover basically gets blown over. <laughs> So here I am, like a few days later after. So um, I, I feel a little rumbling. I, I, I didn't know if it was like my stomach or I, it was a hot day. Oh, gosh, I took off my suit jacket. I left it in the car. Um, and uh, but it was I didn't know if it was like my stomach or if I was dehydrated. 
And then wait, I was like, wait, no, that's not me. And then, cause I felt it shaking and it was like shaking, shaking, but ever increasing in intensity. I was saying to myself, what is going on here? And then it got like, and then it got to a point where it's just like, boom. <laughs> and I was like, oh gosh, I should have took out life insurance. Um, and then uh, sort of after that, the guy, the, 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 the manager, I, I, I then jump up because I had no idea what was going on. And then the, the manager of the dam was like, oh no, Tom, don't worry. That's just the water intake valve. So 400,000 uh, gallons of water every second passes through. It was a 30 foot diameter um uh you, you know water intake pipe and i was sta we were standing right on top of it right when the water opened so i mean and then there was another time i was uh there was a tunnel under construction it, it was the it was the height of the M of the not the empire State, the, the the eiffel tower uh basically from from the top of the soil right to uh basically where this tunnel is so there was no elevator we, I was lowered down in what they call a man cage. So got into this cage and then a crane comes and picks it up, right? And the thing is swaying and it was like snow was on the ground. This is in a Midwestern city um, and snow was on the ground and, you know, basically dropped all the way down. And I mean, so, so, so I, I've been very fortunate. I've also, you know, I've traveled the world speaking at conferences and, uh, you know, attending conference, I've been to, you know, Paris, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, and, and sort of the other thing that I really enjoy is uh, my volunteer work with CFA Institute. Um, in 2017, I was named the uh, inaugural global outstanding young leader of the CFA Institute, um, really resulting in my work around um, providing a forum for uh, objective and independent views of, um, you, you know, the, the frankly, the world's largest uh, investors. Um, so it's been, it, it's, been, it's been really cool. And through that, I've gotten to travel to places like um, Lima, Peru. When I was there, actually, they had, <laughs> uh, since uh, Fujimoro in the 1980s, um, it's been a stable country until the day I get there. And then they, they, they dissolved the Congress. So here I am, I'm, uh, I'm down there. I led a delegation of family offices and and uh, large institutional investors uh, to go speak at a conference down there to the Peruvian investment community in, in Lima. This was, this was in last October. So then what happens is I'm, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the TV. I was in the Swiss hotel, very beautiful hotel, a five-star hotel in, in, in Lima. And um, so I'm saying to myself, wait, what's that? I'm seeing all these protests. And then you see the uh, news flash you know, parliament has been dissolved or something like that. And then I'm saying to myself, oh gosh. So then, so then uh, the chief investment officer of New York Life Investment Management, which actually recruits at, at he actually recruits at, uh, at Baruch. Um, I got to get him to recruit at Macaulay too. But so I was with him and uh, he, he comes down after he rested because, you know, we were on a whirlwind. We, 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 we presented at, at this this conference and then we went and we met with all these high ranking people in their finance community. So then he comes on and he's looking at the screen, like we're, we're in the hotel bar. And then he's like, Oh, where's that? Um, and then one of my friends is like, Oh, Jay, that's, that's down the street. He's like, Oh crap. We got, we got to get the hell out of here. So it took us three hours to make it to the airport, but I knew I was okay when, uh, but when I saw the gates to the airport, I was like, yes. And then the military opened them up and we, you know, we got in. So, um, but that was a scary, you know, it was like, because living in the U.S., you know, I, I, I'd never sort of experienced anything like that. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's just, I'm a, you know, just an American, but, uh, you, you know, sort of just being in that environment, um, you know, it's a beautiful place. I, I love Peru. It's just sort of when when you had that type of unrest, it was a bit scary when you're trying to get, get back. And so there's been so many other stories around travel. Uh, there was one time in, in, in Paris, and, and this stuff is important because um, the world is a very, very, um, it, it, it's become flat. The, the, the world, even despite what's going on with Brexit and Trump and, and other policies like that, you know, the world, the, the trend has been towards globalization. 
So your careers, if you want to be in finance, you're going to be traveling. So, um, so I'll give you an example. Um, and sorry, Sam, for monopolizing all the time. But, it's totally um, fine. <laughs> we love so, to hear about your experiences. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Paris once. And, and I get a, I was speaking at a conference, um, and uh, I was going back, um, and uh, so then I, 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 get in the, I get in the taxi, right, and I have like an hour and a half, and I'm sent to get to Charles de Gaulle Airport, and remember that, Charles de Gaulle Airport, it's very important. So I get to the airport, right, and then I look at my flight number, and then I see you know, it's on the screen in Europe. They have like these, um, these, these, these things with the flight. It, it's in, in Europe, the, the airports are a little bit more modern because they don't have as many as in the US. So they have like this. So I see my flight number. I'm like, wait, Orly, it's not CDG. CDG is the acronym for Charles de Gaulle. So then I go to the counter. I'm like, Polly Um And then the, the counter person like, we, you know, because my French isn't good. Uh, my Spanish, I need to work on too. I mean, that's another thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so I go up. That's what's side of So I go up to the counter. I'm like, um, so uh, Polly Vunglais, she's like, we. Oui. And I'm like, so this is my flight number. I show her on my phone. And then I'm like, but it says O-R-Y as the airport. It shouldn't it say Charles de Gaulle? Stupid me. I didn't know that there were two airports in Paris. So by this time, it was like an hour and 15 minutes until a flight. And I had an important meeting the next day in New York for work. So I say to myself, she's telling me, oh, you got to wait for the bus to bring you there. And it's going to take two hours. I said, no, no, I got to make this flight. This is like, it was like 8 p.m. or whatever. And because, because, because Paris is six, six hours ahead. So I'm saying, oh my God, what am I going to do? So then I was. I was looking for this bus stop and then I see a guy with this, um, you know, like a driver, he was smoking a cigarette um, and he had a BMW, like a, like a, tr a BMW truck. I'm like, Sarah, so, huh, we can maybe make it <laughs> in that truck. So then I, I went over to him. I was like, do you think it would be possible to get me to Orly airport within, um, within an hour? He said, uh, with this traffic, no. <laughs> I'm like, could we try at least? So this guy, he was amazing. I mean, he was like weaving in and out and he was, he, he got me there in like 45 minutes. He was going like, you know, maybe a hundred kilometers an hour. And I was like, you're the man. Like I gave him a fist pump and he was a great guy. Um, so, and then, you know, um, the company picked up the, <laughs> the expense of that, of that it was like, uh, over a hundred Euro, but, um, but you yeah, know, so it was, um, yeah, so I've lived a, a very interesting life, <laughs> and I'm still I'm still fairly young. I'm o I only just recently turned thirty, um, so and then uh, sort of the other thing I, I really enjoy doing is giving back. Um, uh, we, we we've helped over ten thousand children in Africa uh, by repairing eight schools. Um, you know, again, this is over eleven, twelve years now, but uh, no, eleven. But I, I wish I could say we helped that many o over a long period of time. But, you, you know, I'm very proud of it. Um, you know, I was the um, the organizer of uh, a closing bell ceremony at the NASDAQ for um, the president of Sierra Leone in, in 2011, um, September 23rd. So, um, y y you know, it's, uh, it's bittersweet with the foundation because uh, two of my best friends, uh, one was from uh, Senegal and one was from Sierra Leone. Um, uh, Serene Juke, uh, he passed away. Um, and then recently, Fode Monsere, Ambassador Monsere from Sierra Leone, he passed away due to COVID complications. So it's been hard. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm still in touch with our team there in Africa. And, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to get to that, uh, you know, the next that we renovate. But sort of, you know, what I firmly believe in is two things. Are, 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 are vital. Education and guidance. If you just have education, it's not enough. You need guidance too. You need good mentors. You need good sponsors. People who know what they're doing and who can guide you and who have a vested interest in seeing you succeed. The problem is there's not a lot of people out there with that mindset about wanting to help the next generation in, in, a, in a meaningful way.
And there are reasons about that. People are busy. They have children. They have wives. They have husbands. They have families. They have spouses. It's hard. Believe me, working, you know, working is very hard. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't blame them. It's just I wish that, um, you, you know, more people would, would, would be more helpful. So what I try to do is compensate with that and, um, you know, to try to, uh, to help as many as possible and to also – you know, we, we've recruited over, what is it, Gia? I mean, it's got to be like maybe a hundred alumni across all of the, all of yeah, the different, uh, over different... 110 alumni <laughs> prior yeah. to the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we recruited a lot of alumni uh, to, to get involved as, as mentors. And it, it's not just that in finance, it's, it's across all of the, all of the, you know, employment sectors or categories that, uh, you know, we have, so we, we, we tried to do that for, for the students, because again, knowledge is power, but knowing how to get in a position to apply that knowledge, that's key. And, and that's something that is so vital and can only be accomplished by mentors. I was fortunate. I, ha I got lucky. I didn't have a lot of mentors, you know, while I was in college, but you know, those that did really guided me through and, and were the reason I got where I am today. So um, it's very important. You could be the smartest person in the world, but if you don't know how to navigate and to break into the field that you want to be into, it's really hard. And, and I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying, you, you know, it's, it, it makes it a much easier process to have that you know, um, sponsor, right, in, in the firm advocating for you or you know, someone t connecting you to a friend, right, who is a hiring manager for an internship, right, or, or, or whatever. So I'm so sorry, Sam, for, for totally monopolizing not. this. <laughs> that was one of my questions as well, because you mentioned in your bio that you maintain over 13,000 connections on LinkedIn. So do you have any tips for networking that is specific to the finance industry and strategies for maintaining such a strong professional network? Do I? <laughs> So I got fortunate. So I've, I, I've organized over 110 events that have been attended by well over um, probably 20,000 uh, people around the world. Um, you, you know, 90 of them were um, in person, you know, 20 of them have been virtual. So featuring everyone from Lady Rothschild to Valerie Rockefeller to, I mean, you name it, um, you, you, you know, uh, Ted Roosevelt, you know, Justin Rockefeller, you know, it's just like, um, so I've been very fortunate to use the platform that CFA Society New York has uh, to basically build rapport with attendees, right? Over 20,000 people have attended my events, about 3,000 virtually and 17,000 in person. And then also with the speakers and the speakers tend to be very high level people. Um, so I've been very, very fortunate in, in that respect. I will tell you that to keep up with that network is a job in and of itself. When before COVID, every night, every night, every night, it was meetings and events and dinners and who's in from Abu Dhabi, who's in from Qatar, who's in from Singapore, who's in from Melbourne, Who's in from Paris? Who's in from London? Who's in town from Sao Paulo, Mexico City, you know, Frankfurt, Germany, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. So it's a global network uh, that we were able to, to, to create. And, um, you know, basically how I learn, I'm a little bit of a different, even though I, I have the CFA charter, um, you know, that test is a nightmare <laughs> for people like me who are not... Who, who, it's, it's difficult for me to sit down for a long period of time and read a book for a long period of time. It doesn't work for me. I need to do, you know, I learn by doing, whether it be doing practice questions, right? You know, even when I was in school, um, you know, I, I would learn by doing the practice questions, not so much reading the text. Uh, so that's how I passed the CFA. I did like probably 3,000 practice tests, practice questions for each of the three levels. But no, it was very hard. I, I failed uh, uh, a number of levels. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but now I have it. <laughs> so, but, um, but,
but uh, sort of what I encourage you to do is get, in, you know, certainly look during COVID, all we can do is, is this virtual. So what I would encourage you to do is, is listen, right? You know, go to virtual meetings that are hosted by these organizations. I have a list on my LinkedIn, connect with me in LinkedIn, then register to receive updates from all these organizations. And then when they have a webinar, go and, you know, watch that webinar. And then what you could do is send an email to the speaker. Generally what happens is, and, and, and how I do things was when I was first starting out building this network, cause I had nothing, you know, I came from a fairly humble beginnings. Um, you know, people think I come from Connecticut cause how I look, but you know, I grew up, you know, I went to New York city public schools. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn and, and, you know, I grew up also in Staten Island too. And um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Wu-Tang Clan, but you kill a Hills 10304. So, I mean, all my friends growing up were minorities, right? You know, so, I may look one way, but I, I identify, right, as, as, um, as a person of color, Frank, even though I, I know it looks crazy. Um, but, uh, and, and that's why I have such, a, such an affinity for, um, you know, for, for our students, because a lot of you were like me, you, you, you know, either children of immigrants or, or immigrants yourself or come from low socioeconomic, you know, difficult, right, socioeconomic um, backgrounds. You know, I was on government assistance, right? If it wasn't for government aid, I, I probably would have been dead right right now because, um, you know, I had a number of concussions growing up. You know, I, I, I've, I've lived a difficult life and, uh, you know, I was able to uh, to persevere. Um, but I certainly don't forget, you, you know, and um, sort of the injustices that are that are done, um, you know, by. So so the other thing that I'm actually up doing now is I'm a member of uh, they, they put me up, uh, for, my company put me up to be a Coro leader, which is like a public servant leadership training program. Uh, so I'm one of the two Moody's representatives. And, you know, they go in sort of this, um, this emphasis on sort of equality, right? And, and, and sort of, you know, there's a lot of unfair things in this world. And the thing that I needed to tell these people who, you know, these people are, you know, good people. In, in the program, I, I really love them. They're similar stories to me, but the, the difference is they didn't go to public school for college. They went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and they don't understand the struggle. They understand the struggle of that. They understand the struggle, right? But they don't understand the struggle that we understand, which is it's difficult to break in because we didn't go to Harvard and, and whatnot. So, I, so this is my mission to point out the discriminatory behavior of employers by not recruiting fairly from all universities, not just go to the top 20 schools. That's a bunch of crap. That's what's happening. So I want you all to be vocal advocates once you get into positions of power and, and call out the leadership, right? And again, don't, don't overdo it. But whenever you have a chance, say, hey, why do public university students not get recruited to this industry with on-campus recruiting in a way that's meaningful? I don't understand. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It's not diverse and it's not inclusive. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry. It's just something I'm super passionate about because I was discriminated against. They wouldn't even look at my resume you know, when I was um, applying for jobs in the finance world because I didn't go to a target school. What the heck is that? That's a bunch of crap. Isn't that discrim? That's like, that. that is discrimination. <laughs> They're not going to consider me because I don't go to a certain school. I mean, that's like saying you're not going to consider me because, you know, my hair is whatever it is, dark brown. You know, it's like, stupid. I mean, how do you do that? So I'll, 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 I'll shut up. But that's something around equality that no one's talking about. And it's the biggest travesty that no one is talking about it because it's not fair what happens to our kids, you know, our students. And, um, you know, it's just how we really break down sort of these barriers around, um, you know, in income inequality and other things is to this university system, in my own personal opinion. And I'm sorry if I'm getting, I, I tend to be very liberal because again, you know, I've, I've been through, uh, a, I've seen the system and how it disadvantages 
working people. Like, like you know, I was fortunate. You know, I, I came from a very blue collar uh, environment and family, and, and I was able to get the white collar. Hence is why I wore, wore this uh, shirt. But it's, it's a bunch of crap. And we need to start calling about the, the, you know, these, you know, how could companies be diverse and inclusive if they're only recruiting from 20 schools? You tell me, you know, it's very, it's a very easy sort of, so, but, but again, these questions need to start being asked. That's the thing. And Gia, what we need to really do, and I'm serious about this, we got to really contact um, the lady at uh, the partnership for New York. She's spoken at our our college before. Um, her name is Kathleen Wild. They just had 100 and, 136 CEOs sign a letter to Mary, Mayor de Blasio saying you got to increase services or something. What we need to do is have a discussion about her around asking companies, how are you diverse and inclusive if you're only recruiting from 20 schools and you're not opening up or considering seriously anyone else within the formal process, right? So what I teach my mentees to do is get in through the back door, like I got through, right? But that back door is not, so I really need your help. And Jamie too, I really need both of your help. We need to have a discussion with Kathleen, Kathleen Wild, you, you know, and frankly, Tony Meyer too should, should be involved. And we need to, 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 to do a similar pledge, right? Because that's a powerful constituency. And if we get that group to say, we're going to end on-campus recruiting of only selected 20 schools because it's un, it's, it, it goes against equality and, and it's not inclusive and it's not diverse, you know, that's what I think we need to do. But I'm sorry about getting way off track. It's just, I'm very passionate about fighting injustice. When I see injustice, I'm going to fight it. And this is a huge injustice that no one's talking about. There's a lot of great coverage on injustices. But this is something that no one else is talking about. We need to champion this as Macaulay. So. And relating to that, um, do you have any advice for students who are nervous about finance interviews? And even especially in this environment where they're competing against so many people from Ivy League schools, how can Macaulay students and Macaulay candidates stand out in that process? Yeah, it's called networking. And what you need to do is get in front of people who work at the companies that you're interested in working in. And what you do is you then ask them for an informational interview. So how would I suggest you go about doing this? Go to my LinkedIn page. Then what you do is you then sign up for uh, Andrew Colbeck is joining. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you, my friend? I'm glad. I'm, I'm, am I joining late? I just only just noticed the uh, Anita Romano's message. Oh, no worries. Yeah, no, I, I basically went into, uh, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll let um, my, uh, our students uh, give you an update on what they've learned so far. Uh, Andrew was actually uh, um, uh, a part of the uh, business school at the College of Staten Island, which every year we, um, we do a, a summit at, uh, for all of the students there and 300 students, uh, um, you, you know, uh, join every year. So maybe if you could, uh, let's see, I, I, this is a test to see how well um, everyone was paying attention to what I've said so far. So uh, do I have any volunteers or? I guess I can go. Sure, um, please do. Yeah, so basically what uh, Mr. Burgandy was saying was like uh, how, uh, well, mainly he was talking about how a lot of companies don't really look at public schools and like CUNY system. They kind of put it in the side and how even though we are like hardworking and have the ability to do just as to be just as successful as all these Harvard and elite school people, we have to work like even harder and we have to kind of be smart about the way we approach the situation because it's not going to be given to us. We kind of mm -hmm. have to, you know, make the networks and talk to the people and get to know everybody. That's exactly right. Excellent. Can I say something, Tom? Oh, of course you can. Um, I would say that that's, that is certainly true, what this, uh, uh, the young student has just mentioned. However, I would say don't be discouraged because all the, what I'm seeing is that companies are coming to that realization. 
that there is plenty of talent around and it's not necessarily in the traditional schools where they would go and recruit and more and more companies that traditionally have not looked at CUNY students and I'm talking especially in finance uh, people like the the Morgan Stanley's and the JP Morgan's are, 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 are sending their recruitment for internships certainly for internships to we're seeing them at our school uh it's it's definitely a, a change that's going on so keep plugging away yep no and that's 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 certainly what we want to see more of um you know and sort of my message was not to be discouraged uh but to use it as fuel because here's the other thing that i wanted to share so a very good friend of mine uh he went to undergraduate in harvard and he went to his mba in um no, 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 I'm, I'm mixing up. Uh, undergraduate Princeton, MBA in Harvard. So here he is, he hits age, I think, 42, right? He has a family, he has a mortgage, a house and everything. So he has a lot of expenses, right? And then this poor guy gets laid off. And the issue is he only had two jobs before that. So, you know, one when he was recruited out of Princeton and one when he recruited out of Harvard and then he, he rose through the ranks. And sort of what had happened was he didn't know how to network. And the thing is you can't rely just on headhunters. So I basically needed to teach this guy with the Harvard MBA, this is a true story. You know, <laughs> this was a few years ago, you know, how to network. You know, I had known him through CFA society. He was also a CFA charter holder. Um, and uh, you know, so, so, so the thing that I would say similar to what Andrew just conveyed is, sort of, and, and what I, I'm trying to also convey, and this was sort of the, the, the next stage of what I was gonna go into was, this is actually an opportunity for you to learn skills that will help you in your career, not just today, but also for decades to come. Again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And um, it's really important that you know these skills because that's gonna differentiate you from people who, you know, later in your careers, um, you know, to have these skills. And, and frankly, also, you know, if you, if, if you wanted to make a move, right, it, it's much easier in your a move in your career. You know, it's much easier to, to do so if you have a, a, a bigger network to call upon than just within your, your firm. Um, but sort of that's, that's, that's the silver lining. But, but, but certainly Andrew is right. You know, we're seeing a little bit more interest, but it's not the floodgates that I want to, how I envision this going is equality, right? I, I, I'm big into meritocracy, right? And I hate the fact that for all these years, the only people getting on campus recruiting, right, were these Ivy League folks. Um, but what, what I hope is going to continue is this trend to democratizing and, and being more merit-based um, in in this recruiting uh, process, because believe me, you know, you are just as talented as my junior analysts who go to, who went to Harvard, right? And Princeton and Yale and, and whatnot in Columbia, right? You know, um, you know, and much more hardworking. And, and that's my own opinion, just based on what I've experienced with my mentees, you know, relative to the, to the junior analysts. I've had over 15 junior analysts now, no, 16 maybe to be exact. And, you know, I would choose a Macaulay student any day over any of them. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that's, you know, just by virtue of, you know, there's no sense of entitlement. It's, it's, it's you, you know, getting the job done and, and getting the work done and, and putting the hours in. So um, sorry again for my tirade, Sam. Uh, back to you for, for questions. No problem. Um, I think now we're actually going to open up the floor for questions from our attendees. So if you, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask Thomas directly. Oh, uh, hello. Um, hey. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Um, first off, I want to thank you for all the advice on kind of the soft skills that are important in this uh, industry. Although I'm not sure that I, I'm 100% sure to go into finance. Um, I have two questions. Yeah, of um, One would be someone who is interested in actual kind of hard skills, whether it be economics or whatever, entails in that job how what is a good way to begin learning that and also if you could talk about um your day-to-day kind of like 
what tasks are required of you. I know you have a big portfolio of things to manage, a lot of things going on, but when it comes to the, to the nitty gritty, what is it like required of you and what can we expect if we want to go in this field? Yeah, yeah sure. So I'll start with the first question uh, first because my short-term memory isn't always that great. So I'll have to ask you to remind me uh, what that first question was. So, so with respect to my day-to-day, um, so it varies, right? So pre-COVID or post-COVID would be the question I have uh, to you. I guess if you can do both, uh, more pre-COVID because hopefully that's the world we'll get to um, yep. eventually. So Yeah, yeah, so, sure. So yeah, I, I'd rather address uh, pre-COVID. So, um, so get up around uh, 7 p.m. Um, you, you, you know, and then from there. I'm sorry, uh, 7 p.m. or 8? No, 7 a.m. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish it was 7 p.m. <laughs> so get up at 7 a.m. And then uh, from there, uh, get on an express bus. You, you know, get dressed up uh, in my, uh, you know, either a suit, a suit and tie if I'm meeting with one of the clients, um, either an institutional investor or uh, a debt issuer. Or, um, or an investment banker or an attorney or, or whomever. There's a lot of sort of constituents that um, you know, I have dealings with. But um, sort of, if not, I dress like this. So you, you know, basically that's when I'm in my office. So get into my office around, it, it depends. Um, you know, I, 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 there's no real set schedule for it. Um, but get into my office, say around nine and then, um, you know, read over all the emails that, um, that, that, that I got in and, and respond uh, to those, you know, that came in overnight from either Asia or Europe, um, you know, particularly Europe to try to catch them before the day ends. Um, so there's a lot of coordination globally, uh, which, which goes back to my uh, original uh, sort of talking points around, um, you know, that global nature of things. Um, and, and the importance, um, you, you know, to basically orient yourself as a global thinker, uh, irrespective of sort of, you know, the, the, the notions around Brexit and uh, certain po- policies being pushed by, uh, by different uh, leaders that are, are protectionists, like, you know, our current U.S. president or, you know, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil or, or others. But so, um, so then get in there and then generally I have a line of my junior analysts <laughs> coming in to ask me to review their work. So, or if they need questions answered. So, um, so generally it's, um, it's questions around financial analysis, um, you know, on legal document reading. So I have to be like three things in one. Well, actually a lot more than three, but basically, so, so, so the first thing I need to be is a financial analyst. <laughs> so I'm good at that. I'm good with the numbers. And, and that's the other thing. If you want to enter this profession, the one thing that you should never be unclear of is sort of how to do the job in terms of the, the, the quantitative aspects. And because the, 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 the thing that is, because you could learn that stuff. Um, the things that are harder and that I try to teach are the softer skills, you know, managing office politics. And, but that's for mentees who are already in the workforce. Um, but sort of, you know, questions around, um, you know, financial statements or, you know, reviewing, um, you know, re- a research report that they're writing a first draft on for me or, you know, so, 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 <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how much, you know, I keep my, my, my office door closed because <laughs> I, I'm trying, I try to get work done <laughs> and, you know, I just have a stream of my junior analysts or colleagues always coming in there. So, you know, I, I even, I have two chairs in my, in my office and I even got rid of one of them, but you know, cause I just don't want people bugging me, but it's okay. Um, so I, so, so, so certainly that, so a lot of uh, checking over what they do, you know, then, you know, place calls or emails to my issuers or, you know, I may get a call from an institutional investor about one of the credits in my portfolio. Um, you know, I cover 34 of them. So airports, ports, toll roads, power, project financings, water. Um, so physical infrastructure. Um, so so, so that's, that's, that's always tricky because they're very sophisticated. Um, you know, they're managing in, in, in some instances parts of teams that are running, you know, billion, multi-billion dollar portfolios. So they are very um, sophisticated. So you need to be on your toes with them. 
And then, you know, oftentimes we'll have a meeting with an issuer, right, who's in New York or, you know, or, or whatever. So, so, so those generally take place on the 20th floor uh, that we have in Moody's, which is our, like, conference floor. So, um, and then from there, um, you know, have lunch. <laughs> and, then, um, and then sort of after that, you know, attend a rating committee or two. And the rating committees are where you have a group of Moody's analysts like myself who basically come together and uh, have a discussion, an analytical discussion about, um, you know, about a rating, right? So, um, you know, you can't get that wrong. And that's oftentimes what my junior analysts will also add out as they prepare the materials. So they prepare the materials and then I generally present um, the, uh, the, um, they are generally, um, composed of senior, you know, manager, uh, level, um, sort of, uh, people at the firm. Uh, so you need to be sharp, but they generally are like 30 pages of documentation. Um, you know, and you got to know like the financials for them, you, you know, it's, you got to be sure, you know, what you're, you're, you're saying because, um, you know, you look, people can, can give leeway for mistakes, but it, you, you know, you got to make sure you know what you're doing. Um, you, you know, cause it is serious. Uh, the, the, the role is, is serious. I mean, you know, real, real money is on the line. Um, you know, in terms of for the issuer, in terms of their interest cost savings and, and sort of if an investor is even able to invest in something, there are different thresholds of ratings that sort of, if you're below, you, you know, sometimes there, there isn't the ability to invest. So, um, and then, you know, after that, you, you know, then have, uh, then, then, you know, read, review some, some stuff that my junior analyst did. And then after that, you know, go to an event at night, right. Whether it be a dinner with, you know, the head of the pension fund of France or, you know, the, you know, a senior person at the sovereign wealth fund of, uh, you know, Kuwait, right. Um, or at an event, right. Um, you know, that I organize. So I'll often do the opening remarks and introduce the keynote speaker. Um, and then sort of, uh, you know, at the CFA Society of New York, we have room for like 200 attendees. Um, and then, uh, and then after that, maybe grab a drink with, uh, you know, fellow uh, industry peers, and then, um, and then go home, you know, get home around like, uh, I don't know, 10, 11. And then, uh, get up the next day and uh and start it all over but you know for me it's all about learning and, and and mentoring others and and giving back um because you know like i said to whom much is given much is expected and that's something i i really strongly believe in um so and that's why so even though i don't know any of you personally but i'm i'm like an advocate for you because you know you're just like me you know and i I sort of, I feel very strongly around sort of helping and guiding, right, um, public university students, um, you know, and in particular CUNY and, uh, you know, and Macaulay students. So um, I hope that addressed uh, your first question. Um. <laughs> yes, that was very, uh, very insightful. And if you forgot, my other question was for someone just coming in um, to learn a general aspect about finance or economics, um, any uh, advice you would give to like enter the field what resources yeah sure no that's a great question so um so i would certainly say your textbooks in college they don't go far enough <laughs> so there's a book by um so it depends on what you want to do in finance but i would say that there's a book by josh rosen josh pearl uh, called investment banking I was actually at the book launch at Bloomberg, maybe, I don't know, seven years ago. Um, but that's a good place to start reading because the thing about finance is at the end of the day, it's all based on financial statements. And, you know, even though there's a lot more to it than that, but you got to really be proficient in financial statement analysis. And what that does is that gives you a good sort of sense for, you know, what's involved in investment banking, right? And investment banking is all about sort of, you know, the financial analysis that's underlying it, you know, putting together the presentation that's going to be shown to people like me, right? Um, you know, I'm just going through the process, um, you know, and that's just by virtue of sort of 
a lot of people like to go into um, to investment banking, but sort of it's it, it, it there's a lot more jobs than investment banking. I mean, you have jobs in compliance, you know, risk management, you know, like me, credit risk. Um, you have jobs, you, you know, in trading, sales and trading. Uh, one of our alumni is uh, is this fantastic. She was actually my. I started mentoring her when she was a freshman, and then she got. Um, she actually, by her junior year, she got a, a summer analyst position at Goldman Sachs trading team. She was like the only person from any public school. She, we, we got, we were able to network her way in and, you know, she's done great. And, and, and she's still at Goldman and she's doing, she's doing phenomenal. So, you know, it's, it's not impossible to get to these roles. Um, you know, Ali is certainly an example of someone who did it. Um, super smart you know, um, way smarter than I am. <laughs> and, um, you, you know, so, uh, but, you know, I would start with, with, with doing some reading. And then the second thing is sort of in this virtual environment, you know, attend seminars, you know, that are free and that are focused on finance. And, and what you could do is if you could track down the email address of the speaker and, and, and write them a note after and saying, you know, Hey, I really uh, thought, you know, this insight you brought up around X, right, was interesting. I would love to schedule a Zoom call with you. I'm an, you know, I'm an aspiring finance professional currently attending the City University of New York, Macaulay Honors College. I'm a junior or whatever, uh, sophomore, and I, I would be really keen to learn uh, about your career path and, and where you got today because, you know, I, you, you know your, your, your presentation was very impressive, right? And, um, and then that way you build rapport with that individual. And then when he or she can serve as someone to not only give you insight about sort of their career path, but also what you really, the end goal is to get them to be a sponsor for you, which means for them to go to bat for you in their organization, you know, cause, cause, and, and get your name into, get your resume into the resume pile. Because again, we don't have as, at this point, anyway, as robust a on-campus recruiting um, offering that uh, you know are like the people, my junior analysts who went to, you know, these elite, elite schools. But I would take uh, you know a Macaulay student over over anyone any day, just by virtue of sort of you know the lack of um, any sense of entitlement, uh, and then the hard-working uh, nature of it. Um, you know. That, that's really important things uh, for me. Um, so that, again, another long-winded uh, answer, but I hope that addressed your question specifically around a resource uh, or two resources, right? The first would be that investment banking book by Josh Rosen and Josh Pearl uh, to give you a sense for, you know, a major uh, sort of uh, path within finance. Um, and then secondly, uh, the webinars. Um, so, so connect with me on LinkedIn and then you'll see all the organizations that I have listed there. Um, and the reason why I have them there is because I, I direct all my mentees to go there and then sign up for the, it was the in-person events, uh, but now it's the, um, you know, now it's the webinars. But the go only good thing about this is now, now I'm not like telling someone who's not 21 to go to a drinks networking session, right? You know, so, so I got to be careful sometimes. Like, like uh, I remember one time I was uh, advocating for um, for people to get out and, and go to this uh, thing. It's called um, networking session at Young Professionals in Energy. It's really good. Like I went early in my career, I, I, I would go there and, you know, just just be meeting at at, at the the pa Papillon uh, Bar right by Blackrock on 54th Street. It was great. You have like, you know, you have like 70 people, 70 professionals in there, and you know, you just go in there. It's free, you know, and you 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 meet people, and and sort of that's how I started out too. And sort of for me, it snowballed, um, you know, just by virtue of sort of the volunteer work with CFA Institute and being able to provide a forum. Uh, for um, for really important um, members of the industry to share their views uh, to our members. Uh, we have 11,000 members, but um, sort of the other piece of it was um, that I failed to, to to remember that, you know, there were people who might not be 21 yet. <laughs> so, so that's something that I don't, 
have that issue <laughs> anymore in this virtual world. But, um, you know, it, it, look, it, it does limit things um, living in this virtual world for, for job seekers, but the same tenants hold true. If you work hard on the networking, you do your due diligence, you understand what is sort of required of you and reach out to me, right? You, you know, Gia and Jamie have my, and, and Sam have my, my contact info, you know, please provide it to everyone on this, on this call. I'm always happy to, um, to, to help. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, over the years, I mean, uh, for one-on-one -on -one sort of discussions, a lot of it was phone calls, uh, a few meetings, but, but, but the vast majority was phone. It's got to be approaching a thousand over the years. I mean, it's just because not it's not just Macaulay; it's also CUNY as well. So, um, so you yeah, know, it's been a, a very, uh, very sort of rewarding experience for me to to be able to give back. All right, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, I do want to be mindful of the time; it's currently two p.m. Um, oh. So, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to Thomas for joining us and sharing your insights. Um, Gia is going to put up a poll now so that you guys can give us of how this event went. Um, I think it will go live right now. So please fill that out before you leave the meeting. Do we see the results? <laughs> um, they're just uh, completing them. We have about three out of the nine. Um, okay. Thomas, do you have a few minutes, if anyone else has a few minutes to stay on, um, to ask you some more questions? Uh, sure. I have, um, I have a meeting at 2.15, though. So oh, 15 more it. minutes. Got it. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or you put it in the chat. Um, I had a quick question about uh, basically like choosing which section you wanted to go into. So I know that you're uh, like a chartered financial analyst, whatever, um, but uh, how did you pick like infrastructure over some other kind of area of interest? Like how did you decide that was what you wanted to do? Yep. So, um, I, I basically, I, I mentioned this briefly, but I didn't go into it. So good, good follow-up question, Millie. So basically I did research when I was an undergraduate with a professor who specialized in public finance and infrastructure finance. So it really piqued my interest in the, and um, that was sort of, and, and it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a niche area too. It's not, it's not an area that everyone is keen to go into and, um, sort of when you're, when you're going at it, when you're just starting out, what you really need to demonstrate is interest and sort of capacity to do the job of a junior analyst. You don't, you're not expected to be a, a genius or an expert in anything, but just to demonstrate interest and to have a story about why you want to do something. So, um, you know, and, and, and my story was pretty, pretty convincing. Um, and then also sort of to have that internship at the New York City Pension Fund, the Comptroller's Office, was also a way to convey that, you know, I was really interested in the, in the, bi um, in the cross section of where finance and policy meet, right, and, 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 and sort of something that's also tangible, um, which is infrastructure. There's nothing more tangible than, than infrastructure. So, um, you know, it's not like technology, right, that, you know, sure, it's a tangible you know, it's a tangible device, right? But it's not a tangible asset, right? It's not a business based on a t tangible asset. It's a business, con um, you know, sort of focused on consumables, right? Um, not, not so much an actual uh, mechanism for throughput, right? Um, you, you know, passing vehicles or, or people or, or whatnot and, and sort of that's really essential. I mean, you know, without power, you know, we... <laughs> If the power were to go off in this country today, it would be a complete nightmare. I mean, there's nothing more essential than power, 
right? Um, and of course, water too, right? So, so water and power. So I just, I, I just, I felt a lot of comfort around, you know, stability um, in, 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 in the asset class. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course. Oh, I have a question. So out of like the three majors, which one do you think most like helped you or like did all of them together help you more, you think? Um, that is such a good question. Um, I, you're going to laugh, but even though I'm a financial analyst, the accounting major helped me the most because finance is all, the language of finance is financial statements. And the language of financial statements is accounting. So if you want to, you know, and that's why I gave that recommendation around that investment banking by Josh Rosen and Josh Pearl book, because financial statements are the basis of everything that we do in finance. You know, again, there's a lot of stuff on the margins, but sort of that's the bedrock of what we do. And that even reflected sort of the reason why the CFA exam is so heavily weighted and financial statement analysis is because by virtue of what we do, we're, we're financial analysts. We analyze financial statements. And um, so the accounting probably was the, was the most um, sort of, even though it sounds counterproductive and certainly I, not counterproductive, counterintuitive, um, but, but certainly I use the economics background in sort of thinking about the service territories of the assets, the infrastructure assets that I'm responsible for, you know, thinking about the, the, the geopolitical and geoeconomic sort of um, consequences that, that they have. So it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of everything, but sort of at the junior level, it's the financial statement analysis. And then sort of as you progress in your career, um, you get less doing, you know, the, into the weeds, right? Um, the weeds is what I would term, you know, doing the financial modeling and all this stuff and reading the contracts, even though you still need to do it, but then you start to oversee people who, who, who do that um, instead of, uh, instead of um, you know, doing it yourself. But again, that comes with, with um, you know, time on the ice. So you're not gonna be expected to do any of that overnight. You know, that comes after you've had time to build those competencies, you know, and then also, you, you know, with your tenure as well and, and sort of your education, so. Thank you. Of course. Uh, I kind of had a follow up question. I know you got to go soon, but um, yep. kind of what Alex was saying out of the three degrees, were you like planning on going into triple majoring from the start or like how did that happen? Uh, no, that was an evolution. <laughs> um, I don't think you could do it. Andrew, you can't do the triple major anymore, right? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure of the actual. Um, mechanics of what you can do but um i know i don't know of anybody that's doing a triple major but uh i'm not sure it's it's i guess it's possible if you're if you're motivated enough like right. you were I'm sure it's possible right you know but i i don't know because i thought they told me last time i was there in november that no yeah it's not possible you know they can't do it do it anymore but but yeah no um how that sort of came about was that there was a lot of overlapping um, sort of requirements, right? And then how, how it sort of um, it was, if I only took like five more classes, I would get the accounting degree in addition to the finance and the economics. And then in order to get the economics degree, I just needed to do like uh, two more classes or something like, I don't, I don't remember the specifics, but sort of it was like, okay, you know what, let's just master all of the key things, right? Because if you listen to what, what really was the influence was Warren Buffett, <laughs> a quote from Warren Buffett. He was the one who said, uh, financial statements are the, are, financial statements and accounting is the language of finance. So, what, you know, it was really after that quote that I, I really went to, uh, to pursue that accounting, um, but sort of having all a background in all three is really important because sort of you get that sort of, um, you know, like I was saying, a geoeconomic uh, sort of 
thought, thought process going. Uh, then you get the, fi the hard, you know, hard skills of finance, um, you know, going in terms of, you know, how to apply the financial statements to your financial analysis. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the three really, um, you know, they, they, they come together really well. So, but yeah, it was that quote from Warren Buffett around, because at first it was just uh, finance and economics. Thank you. Um, and before everyone goes, I just wanted to say that we actually have another event coming up next week on Thursday, our finance industry talks. So for that event, there's going to be five panelists. Um, we have, I believe, panelists from Bloomberg, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Nomura, as well as BDO. And so in that event, you'll be able to listen to a panel discussion and also be put into breakout rooms with the panelists. So you'll have small group discussions and be able to network with those professionals. So if you're interested in that event, it's going to be next Thursday, September 24th. And Gia sent over the link in the chat for uh, registering for it. So if you're available, then be sure to attend. Do you have no, any final questions? Anyone else? Oh, um, so uh, yeah. Um, so there's this Macaulay requirement where students either do study abroad or internship experience mm -hmm. last research. So like, with the internship, it provides like on-hand experience and study abroad, it's like professional travel experience, which you mentioned earlier, happens a lot within the field, but which do you think would be more helpful in getting like started in this field? So what I used my, my Macaulay Opportunities Fund money for were two things. So it was the Investment Banking Institute um, Financial Statement Analysis Bootcamp. It was like, I think $2,500 and then to start the CFA program, which was, uh, I don't know, maybe, um, I don't know, $1,500. So I didn't use all the 7,000. The thing that I really regret though, was not traveling abroad. You know, as I had mentioned um, earlier, I've, I've been able to see the world, you know, through, you know, going to conferences and, and, and different things in Paris, London, you know, South America, Asia, but, sort of the thing that I wish I would have done was, you know, you know, take, take like an economics course in London, right? You know, that's what I really wish I would have did. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's water under the bridge now, but I was very focused on that internship experience. Um, and, and, and frankly, you know, getting a job, that was really my, my main, main, main focus. Um, but, you yeah, know, please, if you, if you can, you know, try, try to, 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 to do it all, right? But, but definitely, um, you know, try to, to study abroad. Um, that's something I do regret. That's the only thing I regret about um, at my experience at Macaulay. Thank you. All right, so I, I do want to be mindful of your time too, Thomas, and, and I appreciate so much that you stayed even longer than the session was supposed to be. Um, as always, it's a pleasure um, to collaborate with you and to have you join us and, and speak to students. I think they always can benefit um, from your wisdom and your knowledge and experience. Um, so thank you so, so much uh, for your continued efforts and for joining us today. It's my pleasure. I hope everyone got, thought it was, uh, what was insightful and um, you know, worthwhile rather. So. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Happy Friday. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Yep. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Take care. And if you need, any, you know, if you ever want to reach out, Gia has my email. Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much. Bye-bye.